So um, I'm going to take about maybe 20, 25 minutes and uh, walk you through some of the complexities that we're dealing with, with disease outbreaks and other emergencies around the world, but focus pretty much on, on COVID. So what I'd like to do is to describe the, the burden of emergency needs and risks, both globally, but I'm going to take a specific focus on the part of the world where I work, which is called the Eastern Mediterranean region. Um, I'm all, because we have so much conflict and so many fragile states in our region, I'm going to talk about some of the specific challenges related to fragile, conflict-affected and vulnerable countries, uh, especially as it relates to controlling the pandemic. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the global priorities for ending the acute phase of the pandemic, and then talk about some of the strategies and thinkings about preparing and uh, preventing future pandemics. So here are the, the, big, the big numbers. Each year um, across the globe, there's around uh, 200 disease outbreaks. I think what's important to, to note is that around 70% of cases of epidemic prone diseases occur in uh, fragile, conflict affected and vulnerable countries. So we carry a disproportionate burden of infectious diseases in our region. Last year, there were around there were around 430 odd uh, natural disasters. Uh, that's a 24% increase over the annual average from the previous two decades. 88% of those were hydrometeorological. Uh, again, we all know that climate change is dr is driving more frequent and more severe uh, extreme weather events. But I think what's really underappreciated in much of the Western world is uh, the burden of conflict and displacement. Uh, this, you know, what's gone unnoticed over the last two and a half years since the, um, the, pa the pandemic started is that the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance globally has increased from 80 by 80%. So look at this, we now have 302 million people in need of human humanitarian assistance worldwide. Uh, and that's a dramatic increase, oops, sorry, from just the start of uh, 2020. It's an overwhelming burden for us. 90% um, of that humanitarian burden is, uh, is conflict related. And half of the 30 countries that have large scale humanitarian crises had an increase in the number of people needing assistance over the last 12 months. For example, Syria, the conflict's been going on there for 11 years. There are more people in need of humanitarian assistance today than there have been any other time uh, of the conflict. And here's, here's the Eastern Mediterranean region. We cover 22 countries from Morocco in Northwest Africa, across most, most of Northern Africa. We cover Somalia and Sudan and Djibouti, then right across the Middle East, uh, except Israel, uh, as far as Afghanistan, Pakistan. We are currently responding to 61 public health events, outbreaks, natural disasters, technological disasters, um, humanitarian crises. Six of those are what we would call grade three, all hands on deck. That includes COVID. It includes the crises in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Syria. And it also includes a new crisis, which is a major food security crisis in the Horn of Africa. And for that, for us, that embraces the countries of Sudan, Djibouti, and Somalia. Um, and of the five largest uh, humanitarian operations in the world, four of them are in our region. Uh, we are the source of uh, over 60% of the world's refugees. Many of the refugees leave our region and go to, to Europe, of course. Um, at the same time, of course, we've got, as I've mentioned, plenty of disease outbreaks. In addition to the pandemic, we have 34 ongoing disease outbreaks right now. Uh, that's an increase from 26 last year and is the highest number we've documented in a calendar year in, in probably in the last decade. Um, also, the region is very prone to natural disasters. You may have heard in the last week or two, we've had earthquakes in Afghanistan and Iran. Of the 10 largest natural disasters last year in terms of people affected, them, affected five of them occurred in our region. So, uh, and then of course, we have plenty of technological disasters. You may have heard about the chlorine release in Jordan a couple of days ago. We had the major port explosion in, in, in Beirut a couple of years ago, and we've had more attacks with chemical weapons uh, than any other region. 
So there's always plenty to do. Uh, it's a very diverse and inequitable region. We have six countries that are high income. We have four that are upper middle income. We have seven that are lower middle income and, and five that are low income. So incredible diversity, incredible inequity and uh, enormous needs. So let's get back to COVID. We all know about the impact of COVID. Uh, it's been going on for two and a half years. The global health impact has been absolutely enormous. The official death, death toll is around six and a half million, but uh, more detailed analyses have indicated that deaths from all causes due to the pandemic, around 14.9 million, almost 15 million. So some, some other estimates say up to 20 million people have died from all causes since the pandemic started. The economic impact has far exceeded any projections from the World Bank or any other agency. It's cost the world economy around $12 trillion. Uh, and again, if you look at um, how this relates to uh, economic costs from other, other diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria, about a 40,000% increase above their economic toll to the world economy this pandemic has taken. Of course, kids have been forced out of school. Very importantly, uh, it's expected that well over 100 million people are going to be forced back into poverty because of the pandemic. But we can't look at that in isolation. Uh, you know, there's been this cadence of dis new diseases over the last uh, 20 years that have had global and regional impact. Going back to SARS in 2003, H1N1 pandemic in, in, in 2009, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a new coronavirus that was detected uh, in, in our region in 2012. And you're familiar with the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa and, and, and Congo, Zika, and so on and so on. Uh, and more recently, of course, monkeypox. So it's just a matter of time before the world, the regions um, uh, experience a new disease. So we have to get ourselves ready. Here's the aggregate uh, epidemic curve for, for the pandemic. The, the different shaded colors represent the six regions of WHO. Australia is in the Western Pacific region. We also have a Southeast Asian region. Uh, we have a European region. We have an America's region and we have an Africa region. So you can see we're all sort of just coming off uh, the peak um, of, uh, of the Omicron variant. Uh, but you can see globally, the number of cases are starting to uh, to edge up again, although the number of deaths uh, have decreased over the last two weeks. This is the epidemic curve, the aggregate epidemic curve from our region, and it follows the global trends pretty well, but we've seen in our region um, a, a steady increase in the number of cases over the last four weeks. So we're still not out of it. Here's the, the general summary. So of the six WHO regions that I mentioned over the last week, four of them have had an increase in the number of cases. Um, over the last week of the 194 countries that constitute WHO membership, over a hundred of them have had increases in the last week. So you know, Omicron, the, the pandemic has, has, has not gone away. Um, 83 of those countries had an increase of more than 20% in the number of cases over the last week. And in our region, 10 of our 22 countries had an increase of over 20%. So it's still lingering around. Uh, and you can see the trends there as well with, in relation to deaths. Um, so what's driving this? You know, two and a half years into it, we've had effective vaccines. Why are we still getting these, uh, these spikes of, of, of COVID? I think most of you are familiar with this. I mean, the virus continues to evolve. Uh, and, and of course, with Omicron and the, the subvariants, we now have highly transmissible variants. Um, we still have low levels of, of immunity for a variety of different reasons. I mean, in the low income countries, the, uh, only th uh, around 30%, 13% of, of the population is fully vaccinated. So still a lot of people exposed. Um, a lot of people feel we've, you know, aren't interested in getting vaccinated. We've moved beyond. So there's not only hesitancy from those people who don't trust the health system or um, the public health institutions. We've also got large proportions of the population, particularly in middle income and low middle income countries and low income countries, who think, you know, COVID just doesn't seem to matter. And I've got so many other competing priorities right now with 
uh, economic crises, and, and of course, in our part of the world, um, with all the other emergencies. So COVID does not loom large for many people. Also, we've seen inconsistent and inappropriate use of some of the public health and social measures. These are the mask wearing or the travel restrictions or the restrictions on mass gatherings and uh, you know temporary uh, business closures. And sometimes these, these measures have been lifted without a good analysis or what we would call risk assessment. And, and they're not evidence-based. So, the, you know, this inconsistent use of those types of measures um, has, uh, has contributed to some of the spikes that we have seen. Uh, of course, the misinformation, the disinformation, the gross politicization hasn't helped either. And then finally, weak health systems. And this is, um, Jocelyn, you'll be interested in this photo. This is the intensive care unit of the main infectious disease hospital in Kabul in Afghanistan. And in that room, there's not even a sink to wash your hands. And Jocelyn's an infection prevention and control expert. So, uh, and that's the main referral hospital for, for, the, for the country. So <clears throat> coming back to this point about, okay, so it's tough enough given all those circumstances to get on top of the pandemic. How are we doing in the fragile countries? I, I, I just wanted to highlight some of, some of the trends there. If you look at some of the key performance indicators across our region, again, nine countries with humanitarian crises and the 13 others. In those with the humanitarian crises, the, the, the case fatality rate is three and a half times that of the other countries because of their weak health systems. Their testing rate is less than 1 20th of the other countries. Of course, they haven't been able to scale up their testing as much. Their test positivity rate is one and a half times and their vaccination coverage one fifth. So these are the countries where it's uh, where we face uh, significant challenges. And these are really tough operating environments. Oftentimes we don't have access to those in need because of insecurity or because the belligerents, the fighters in the war don't recognize the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law. We have divided territories and lack of governmental um, legitimacy. So for example, in Syria right now, the country of Syria is under is divided into four areas of control. One up in the northwest, which is controlled by uh, by rebels, and we can only access that part of the country through cross border operations from from uh, from southern Turkey. We've got a large swath of the country now that is under Turkish military occupation. Up in the northeast, there's a semi autonomous region that is controlled by the Kurdish or, uh, minority and the rest of the country is under control of uh, the Damascus government. So we have to negotiate with four different authorities to get access to people in need and to manage our COVID control. In Afghanistan and Sudan right now, those governments are not recognized by the international community and the main donors who help fund pandemic response will not give any money to those, those governments. So, and they're even wary of us having conversations with these guys, but you can't get the job done unless you're sitting down with the Taliban. You cannot get the job done unless you're sitting down with the military government in Sudan. So we have to engage with those guys. Um, in Yemen, for example, it's divided into North Yemen and South Yemen. The Houthi rebels in the North will not let us vaccinate against COVID right now. So these are the day-to-day -day constraints that, that, that we operate with. And of course, major health system disruption, as you can imagine, all these countries have incredibly weak health systems. We have more attacks against healthcare in our region than any other uh, part of the planet. Almost half of the attacks, direct targeting of health facilities or health workers occurred in our region um, last year. You may have heard just, a few, uh, just in the last week, we've had about three or four more polio workers killed in, in Pakistan. And then there's the funding constraints. So it's a tough old environment. Um, but nonetheless, I think we can we can point to some real successes and, and, and significant achievements. Um, for example, we've trained over 50,000 health workers across the region, not just WHO alone, but WHO driving um, this, uh, this capacity building. Um, so uh, advancing uh, clinical skills, particularly around ICU, around oxygen management. We've established this very important oxygen platform because lack of access to oxygen, you don't think about living in the West, but there are many, many countries where they don't even have access to regular medical oxygen. So we've established this platform where we're monitoring, we're assessing access to oxygen <clears throat> and scaling it up. 
I think one of the real successes, not only in our region, but globally, but, but I, I think a great success story is the scaling up of the laboratory capacities. So prior to the pandemic, we had about 40, 40 laboratories across the region that could do PCR testing. Now we have over 650. 21 of our 22 countries now can do genomic sequencing. We only had about one or two before the pandemic. And now we have three regional uh, reference labs for, uh, for sequencing, genomic sequencing across the region. Um, I think we've been able to leverage our influenza surveillance uh, pretty effectively. We have 19 of the 22 countries <clears throat> with very functional sentinel surveillance for in influenza and we're integrating uh, COVID um, and MERS uh, surveillance into those systems. And um, I think one thing that we are particularly proud of, uh, we as EMRO, we, we run the biggest logistics hub for the organization out of Dubai. And last year, we sent 403 shipments to 111 countries of, of, of COVID supplies. And you'll remember at the start of the pandemic, the poor countries were really missing out because the wealthy countries were buying up all the PPE and the vaccines and the diagnostic kits. Um, well, we've really scaled up and, and um, uh, our, our logistics hub in Dubai has become a, a real global asset. Okay, so where do we go from here? I mean, uh, you know, I focused a bit there on, on the fragile states and some of the specificities around our region, the challenges. But thinking more globally um, with, the co with COVID and these recurring spikes, um, how do we plan for the future? Well, right now we, we're doing scenario planning and, and uh, I guess we've got three main scenarios that we're looking at. The base case where the new variants, they just have, you know, they cause less severe disease over time but we continue to see spikes uh, in cases as, as immunity wanes. And um, so therefore we've got to have targeted boosting of, of the most vulnerable groups. Best case scenario is the new variants have significantly reduced severity and we don't need, we won't have to rely on, on, on the booster doses as much, but we also have to think of the worst case scenario where new variants are more severe, cause more severe disease and uh, are more uh, highly transmissible. And then in that instance, we have to adjust our tools, our, uh, our diagnostics, our vaccines, our therapeutics. So those um, uh, contingencies are being looked at and planned for. Um, what are the priorities for getting over the, what we are calling the acute phase of, 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 of the pandemic? Well, I think again, scaling up vaccination is, is still uh, is, is one of our biggest priorities. You may know that the Director General of WHO was aiming to have 70% of the population in every country vaccinated by July this year. Um, so, but we only, we only hit 50, 58 of those uh, 194 countries. So we got our, we only got to around 30% of the countries. Nonetheless, around 61% of the world's population is fully vaccinated. That's two doses, only 13% in the low income countries. Um, so we realize that a lot of people feel that we've moved on and it's very, very hard to, uh, to vaccinate. Um, we are therefore in the low income countries, we are having uh, intensification campaigns. Frankly, they haven't been very successful. We've tried this recently in, in Syria and Sudan. Um, lots of, again, constraints to that. Uh, but we really do, you know, accepting the fact that we're not going to get the vaccination rates up to the levels that we want. What can we do? You've got to focus on the most vulnerable. You've got to make sure that healthcare workers are, in fact, uh, are, are, uh, are vaccinated. You've got to make sure that those with comorbidities in the elderly. So that's, that's how we try to adjust. Um, we've also got to... Um, be more targeted and strategic in our application of public health and social measures and make sure they're context specific. So again, a spe you know, specificity for our region, uh, on the 7th of July, we have uh, what they call Big Eid, the big celebration, Eid uh, al uh, Ahad, and that also marks the beginning of the, of the Hajj. Um, so of course, there's a lot of planning uh, around how we're managing that mass gathering and, and so on. Um, secondly, we've, we're still working to expand surveillance. We've undertaken 17 formal reviews of the COVID uh, response in 17 countries in our region. One of the most 
frequent findings is the fragmentation of surveillance. So we're trying to, you know, have more integrated surveillance. And again, as I mentioned before, integrating influenza surveillance with uh, with the COVID uh, surveillance, and in our region also uh, with MERS, of course. And to that end, working with the diagnostics. So. Uh, for those of you with a bit of a lab background, we're working with the US CDC right now to develop a multiplex test that integrates COVID, influenza, and, and MERS. Um, of course, we still want to scale up genomic sequencing and uh, increasingly working with our colleagues in uh, the animal and agricultural and environmental sectors for this comprehensive One Health approach, because we know that over 70% of new diseases occurring in humans, infectious diseases, come from the, uh, come from the animal sector. So, <clears throat> for example, in our region, we are right now working on a, a big regional strategy for One Health and working more closely with those other sectors. Um, thirdly, uh, you know, what else do we need to do uh, in, the, in the coming months? Further increasing access to the, to the, the countermeasures uh, the vaccines, the therapeutics, um, of course, the diagnostics is a help. And, and you know, as the new variants arise, we, we may need to make adjustments in, in each of those uh, uh, countermeasures. One of the really important issues is scaling up manufacturing and technology transfer. The poor countries got left behind uh, at the, in the first year of this pandemic. They do not trust the West. They don't think we're going to come and help them the next time because Many countries, Canada, Australia, the US, you know, countries in our region, Saudi Arabia, they bought up the vaccines. They bought up four, far more vaccines than they needed. And the, and the poor countries got left behind. And by the time the vaccines became available in the last quarter last year, we're two years into the pandemic and the poorer countries are going, why do we need this now? And so that's, you know, I, I was in Sudan three weeks ago. I asked a group of 10 public health professionals where does COVID now lie in your list of priorities? The average is around fifth or sixth. And they've got a vaccination coverage rate of around 10% right now. And with, this is one of the countries we've just tried to have one of those intensification campaigns. So long way of saying, we've got to help these countries and, and regionally develop their own vaccines. So we've got these this mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub now in South Africa, four of the countries in our region now are developing the capacity to, to, to produce vaccines. Um, and of course, <clears throat> addressing gaps in infection prevention and control, huge issue across our region. I mean, it, it's shocking going into hospitals and getting the sense that healthcare workers don't know how to protect themselves. They don't know how to protect their patients. I, I was absolutely shocked in some of the uh, health facilities that, 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 that we have visited over the last couple of years. Uh, and of course, then there's the, the whole issue of making, you know, the other health services that have been neglected because all the resources have been diverted to, um, to the COVID response. It, it, you know, again, getting those essential health services, getting vaccinations, childhood vaccinations back on track because vaccination coverage rates have fallen off dramatically. Access of women to skilled birth attendants and, and, and hospital deliveries, that's fallen off. So that's another big priority. So there are some of our priorities in the coming months. What about preventing future pandemics? You may know that <clears throat> there's been 23 different reviews of the global pandemic response. Those 23 reviews have come up with 343 recommendations. I think it's incredibly telling to, to look at the categories of those recommendations. 50% of those 343 recommendations related to governance and leadership, including political. You know, political decision-making, coordination, uh, equity. Well, equity is not part of the, the governance and leadership, but there has been such a failure of governance and leadership at the highest levels of government, but even within uh, some elements of the health sector. Only 23% of the recommendations relate to new tool, you know, systems and tools, so like surveillance and labs and treatment and, and, and so on. Uh, another... 20 odd percent relate to financing. There's just not enough money. I mean, we keep, every time we have a big disease outbreak, we say we've got to prepare, but there's no investment in preparedness. It's incredible. Having worked in uh, international humanitarian disaster and outbreak response uh, for the last 27 years, we, you know, it's amazing to see this, this cycle of what we call 
panic and neglect. So everyone's worried when the emergency happens and then they forget about it afterwards. So there's no investment so we can prepare better for the next time. So a lot of recommendations about how to make sure we do invest in preparedness moving forward. Uh, and then of course, a lot of recommendations around equity as well, making sure that the poorer countries don't fall behind. The four main um, global uh, reviews, um, and some of you may be familiar with these. One, one was the, what's called the Global Preparedness Monitoring, Monitoring Board. The other big one was the in, Independent Panel of Pandemic Preparedness and Response. That was the one headed by Helen Clark and um, uh, Ellen Johnson Surley from Liberia. There was an IHR Review Committee, in a, uh, International Health Regulations Review Committee, and then an Independent Oversight Advisory Committee. So they, they were the four big ones. Of the 140 recommendations that came out of their reviews, they were all tabled by a working group to the World Health Assembly in May this year. Unfortunately, the countries of the world could not agree on prioritizing those priorities. Like, I mean, shocking. Here we go back to leadership and governance. We couldn't, even after all this time, we couldn't come together and say, okay, here are the big priorities out of all this, out of all this work. And I think the global preparedness, I this <clears throat> this um this quote really resonates with me. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed a world that is unequal, divided, and unaccountable. You know, we're not learning the lessons and, and applying them. The health emergency ecosystem is not fit for purpose and needs major reform. And we all know it. But in May this year, we couldn't agree on prioritizing the priorities. So I think I, I don't want to diminish the tremendous work that has been going ahead and, 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 and so on, but I, I think I think we could we could we could do more. And I, let me just touch on some of the things, the developments that I think are good. So there's a lot of talk now about improving the global health emergency preparedness and response architecture. Um, as part of that, there is going to be a new global health threats council. This will be constituted by heads of government, heads of state, again, elevating uh, pandemic and emergency preparedness to the highest levels of government. They will meet once a year. And if there is a major public health emergency, they may convene again. Uh, very important, as I said, to increase financing. So there's a big push now for uh, uh, increased domestic financing, just calling governments to make the investments because you know, the health systems clearly aren't up, up, uh, up to it to, to manage the pandemics, uh, you know, the future pandemic threats. Very importantly, the World Bank, uh, with support from WHO and a couple of other agencies, is, is establishing a financial intermediary fund, which will provide the much needed funding for preparedness. And the paper on health emergency on, on the architecture has about 10 recommendations. But for me, the Global Health Threats Council, the finance, fi the new financial mechanisms, are the most important. I think there are some other, you know, very constructive initiatives at the global level. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't f familiar with the international health regulations, this is a global treaty um, that all 194 member states of WHO have, have signed on to, and they have obligations, uh, responsibilities, and, and legal obligations to develop their capacity to, to prepare for, detect, respond to uh, public health threats. It's the main international instrument to control the international spread of disease. Um, and it's pretty good, but I think that the, the pandemic clearly exposed um, some, some major deficiencies. So there'll be targeted amendments to the IHR. The IHR is a, is very much a technical document. And there are issues that need to be addressed that go beyond the domain of the IHR, particularly around financing and governance and One Health and so on. So there will be a new international agreement to complement the IHR. So again, this is at the global level and may sound a bit esoteric, but this is all, these are very important elements of global pandemic and um, health security governance. Another important development is that WHO has recently established a new hub for uh, epidemic and pandemic intelligence, uh, working with, with uh, networks of uh, public health institutes and surveillance uh, um, mechanisms around the world to detect 
potential public health threats early and helping us to in initiate the response. I've already mentioned about the One Health approach. That's absolutely vital. Um, but underlying all of this has to be just strengthening health systems uh, with a real focus on, on, on primary health care. The most resilient health systems will have strong primary health care, including uh, strong vaccination, uh, immunization systems, uh, uh, as I mentioned. Um, just in, in, in just in concluding, I, I, I wanted to raise an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and that's about strengthening emergency management. Any investments that we make in helping us prepare for the next epidemic or pandemic should also be designed in a way that they can help us address emergencies from whatever the cause is. And the science and practice of the discipline of emergency management, we in, in, in public health have an enormous amount to learn. So uh, we need to take what's called a comprehensive approach to, um, to emergency management that, that goes through the emergency management cycle of prevention and, and mitigation, preparedness, detection, response, and recovery. And you know, whatever the emergency is, you have some key functions. You need leadership, you need coordination, you need budget, you need financing, you need operations, you need logistics, whether it's an outbreak, uh, a conflict with, with, with forced displacement or a natural disaster. And we in the health sector haven't really advanced our management capacities as well as I would like, as we would like. So again, these 17 reviews that we've done in um, uh, of the COVID response. I think this is one of the recurring themes that we've we've seen. I've had the privilege of leading four of those reviews. Um, we saw some great work on emergency management in, in Saudi Arabia, but complete fragmentation in other settings. So what you need is, I mean, within the health sector, if you've, you're responding to an epidemic or any other uh, emergency, you need to be able to structure and manage yourself in a coordinated way. As I said, you all, we all have, regardless of the event, there are clear functions that are required. But with a pandemic or other large scale emergency, it's not just the health sector. We need to be able to connect with other sectors, you know, in relation to infectious diseases and, and the pandemic. We need to connect with education, with transport, with immigration, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So what's the intersectoral coordination mechanism? And then in the large scale emergencies, it's the executive branch of government that's going to be making some of the big decisions. So again, how do we connect there? You've got to have a tiered coordinated response. And most countries have not cracked that nut by any stretch of the imagination. So I think this is an area that we need to, to, be, to be looking at uh, in, in, in a lot more detail. <clears throat> and then we have to apply um, emergency management best practices. Okay, so when you do have a big outbreak, and we were talking earlier about you know, okay, so you've got your emergency management team, but the infectious disease guys aren't talking to them. How does that help? So you've got to structure and manage your response uh, in a way that all relevant stakeholders feel a part of it. Uh, and <clears throat> we've learned from, frankly, the US fire service that, a, that a, an approach called the incident management system <clears throat> is perhaps the most effective way of structuring and managing uh, an emergency. So I've probably taken a little bit more time than I anticipated, but I, I, I want to thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, hope I've given you a flavor of what's going on out there. A lot of, a lot of emergencies, a lot of risks and needs. Um, uh, we've still got to get the job done with, pan, with the pandemic. We've got to uh, prepare better for future pandemics. And we've got to prepare not only for those, but for the other emergencies that are, that are staring us in the face. We've made... A lot of great progress, uh, but there's more work uh, to do. And I thought I'd leave you with this lovely picture um, from Sudan of a couple of school teachers who just finished some training on uh, risk communications and, and, and engaging with the communities. Thanks for the opportunity.